Hello and welcome to Frankly Speaking, the show that digs deep into the insights of some of the leading policymakers in the Middle East and indeed the world. I'm Frank Kane. Today, I'm pleased to be joined from New York City by His Excellency Ambassador Abdullah Abwalimi, the permanent representative of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia to the United Nations. In a decade at the UN, he has been at the heart of some of the biggest events in global diplomacy and international relations. Mr. Al-Mwalimi, welcome to Frankly Speaking. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellency, let me start with a contentious issue, Yemen. The Houthis, despite deliberately and repeatedly attacking civilian targets in Saudi Arabia, are still not designated by the UN as a terror group. Tell me, frankly speaking, what more can you do and the mission do in New York to help persuade the international community to see them for the terrorists that they are? Well, we need to do more to present the facts as they are. We have been trying to do that, but we need uh, even more effort in that direction. Besides, uh, there are those in the United Nations or in the Security Council who are reluctant to proceed with designating the Houthis uh, as a terrorist organization for various reasons. We need to overcome these reservations and we need to be able to demonstrate that that designation will not interfere with the delivery and supply of humanitarian uh, support and humanitarian goods and services. I think that's a job that we and the mission of Yemen need to continue to do uh, here at the United Nations. Earlier this year, the Biden administration uh, revoked the previous designation of the Houthis by President Trump around about the same time that they attacked a civilian airport in Abba. What did you make of this? Uh, have you had a chance to talk to the US counterpart uh, at the UN about this? Yes, we have been talking to them. They explained to us that the reason they did that is purely technical because they have staff in Yemen that are working with humanitarian organizations and they have Yemeni people who are also working with these organizations. And they said that if the Houthis are designated as a terrorist organization, the Yemeni parties would not be able to deal with them. And uh, that would put the lives and safety of the American parties in jeopardy. Now, we're not quite convinced that that is a good argument. However, they believe that this is the main argument. It is to protect the uh, well-being of the American people who are working in Yemen to distribute and help uh, disseminate the humanitarian uh, supplies. Uh, we will continue to work with the Americans on, on this issue. We will continue to demonstrate that designating the Houthis uh, for what they are, a terrorist organization, is not going to have negative repercussions and we will, we will continue to do every effort in that direction. Bringing an end to the conflict in Yemen has so far proved to be a pretty intractable problem, hasn't it? Why? What, what should the UN do to advance the cause of peace there? Well, it has proved to be intractable simply because the Houthis continue to receive a continuous supply of weapons and ammunition from their benefactors, particularly Iran. What the United Nations should do more of is tighten the grip on the supply routes to Yemen, particularly the sea routes, that have been used to smuggle arms and ammunition into, into Yemen. Uh, and I think this is something that the uh, big powers, the P5, need to do more of and need to provide the United Nations with the means necessary to, to be able to apply United Nations resolutions that prohibit the supply of weapons and ammunition to the Houthis. You mentioned Iran and there have been informal talks between uh, some GCC countries and Iran and suggestions of a renewed appetite for entente between Saudi Arabia and Iran. What's the diplomat's view of that situation? The situation still is the same with, uh, with Iran. The, there have been talks in Baghdad under the auspices of the Iraqi government uh, but no major results have been achieved there. 
the Iranians take a long-term attitude towards these talks. We are not interested in talks for the sake of talks or for the sake of uh, photo opportunities. We would like to push these discussions towards substantive issues uh, that uh, involve the behavior of the Iranian government in the region. And we hope that the Iranians will be able to respond uh, in kind to, to this effort. But as long as the Iranians continue to play games with these talks, they are not going to go anywhere. The other seemingly intractable issue in Saudi foreign policy at the moment is the situation in Palestine. Uh, despite moves by some Arab countries towards closer ties with Israel. Uh, but in your view, is there any point in opening up uh, with, with Tel Aviv until there is a genuine change of heart by Israel? What's the official and latest Saudi position towards normalization of ties with Israel? The official and latest Saudi position is that we are prepared to normalize relations with Israel as soon as Israel uh, implements the elements of the Saudi peace initiative that was presented in 2002, that calls for the uh, end of occupation of all Arab territories occupied in 1967, uh, and the establishment of an independent Palestinian state with East Jerusalem as its capital, uh, and granting the Palestinian people the right of self-determination. As soon as that happens, not only Saudi Arabia, but the entire Muslim world, all 57 countries of the OIC would follow, follow suit in terms of recognizing the state of Israel and establishing relations with her. In that context, uh, you recently criticized, quote, aggressive Israeli measures in the West Bank and Gaza, and you reiterated the kingdom's commitment to the rights of the Palestinian people. Uh, but frankly speaking, that stance has achieved nothing in decades now. Why should it be any different this time? Well, uh, time does not change uh, right or wrong. Uh, the Israeli occupation of Palestinian territories is wrong, no matter how long it lasts. Israeli practices in the West Bank and Gaza with regards to settlements and with regards to the siege and with regards to denying the Palestinians their dignity and their rights is wrong. And that doesn't change even if it takes years to uh, passing by. So time has nothing to do with right or wrong. There are things that are right, uh, no matter how long the time passes by. Okay, uh, on a slightly different but no less controversial subject, uh, Saudi Arabia has served two terms on the UN Human Rights Council in the decade up to 2020. What do you think was achieved in that time? Uh, a lot has been achieved inside Saudi Arabia and outside. Inside Saudi Arabia, we have uh, progressed our commitment to all human rights and uh, uh, to the rule of law, to the uh, uh, participation in international treaties and uh, agreements. And outside, we have been committed to cooperating and working with other countries uh, towards the achievement of the noble objectives of the human rights uh, body. So uh, we have proven to be a committed member of the Human Rights Council, uh, an interested and an engaged member, and we have paved the way uh, for more countries to follow suit in terms of their commitment to the Human Rights Charter. The past few years inside the kingdom uh, have seen a large number of reforms being introduced, haven't they? Uh, women driving, lifting of guardianship laws, more religious tolerance. Do you think that these reforms are being seen and appreciated for the groundbreaking changes that they are by the international community? Not quite. I think many in the international community think of them as insufficient or, or not far enough uh, or they probably don't believe that we have gone as far as we have gone already. And this is why we're encouraging people in the West to come and visit, opening up visas, opening up uh, tourism, and opening up official delegations coming in and going out to other countries. So it's our responsibility to make sure that we communicate the correct image and the correct information uh, to the world community. And I think we're, we're trying to do that and we hope to be able to do more of that in the near future. 
And will this uh, help tackle the problem of the negative coverage that Saudi Arabia gets around the world? I hope so. I hope so. I think that there are certain quarters who look for the negative coverage just because it suits their agenda and their uh, desires and their objectives. But by and large, the international community, the international media will be able to report on a positive picture once they see it and once they, they recognize it. Okay, from your position there in uh, uh, Manhattan, um, you are at the heart of the global world uh, and the pandemic, of course, uh, has been, or rather the reaction to the pandemic has been criticized by some people uh, for not tackling the issue in a proper way, uh, especially with regard to the spread of the disease in the, in the developing world. Do you think the global community should have, be, have done more in this respect? Definitely. Uh, it's obvious that <clears throat> the coverage for the vaccines continues to be extremely low in countries of the South, in Africa and Asia and elsewhere. Uh, while it may have re reached higher percentages elsewhere in the north. We must recognize that we will not be able to defeat this pandemic until and unless we defeat it everywhere. Uh, we are not safe until everybody is safe. Saudi Arabia has taken a leading role, especially when it was chair of the group of 20, uh, towards allocating funds and allocating vaccines uh, to the developing countries. We have allocated more than $500 million, contributed more than $500 million on our own, and we continue to contribute hundreds of millions uh, more dollars, both in cash and in kind, uh, to developing countries in, in various parts of the world. On another burning issue, uh, climate change, Saudi Arabia has been spearheading regional efforts on climate change by introducing the Saudi Green Initiative, taking part in the Middle East Green Initiative. Tell me, what do you think the kingdom is hoping to achieve? Uh, and frankly speaking, if the rest of the world, especially the big polluters like China, India, the USA, if they don't go along with it, what can be achieved? Well, if the big polluters don't go along with it, very little can be achieved. But I'm, I'm hopeful, optimistic, that all countries of the world have come to recognize the urgency and necessity of doing more on the climate change issue. I think the COP26 uh, meeting has generated a great deal of commitment and interest in tackling the problem in at least preserving the 1.5 degrees issue as a target uh, and in, in doing more across the board. Saudi Arabia has come forward for the first time with very ambitious targets regarding uh, carbon emissions uh, and regarding CO2. Uh, and we hope that that will give the world an example uh, of a country that is dependent on, on uh, carbon energy, but nevertheless is willing to make the commitments that it had made uh, towards the benefit of the, of the world environment. With regard to the United Nations as an organization, uh, some members of the UN quite regularly hit out at what they allege is a, a US-oriented slant within the United Nations. What's your opinion on this? Should the HQ, do you think, be moved from New York, maybe rotated around the world on a regular basis? No, that would not be practical or realistic. Uh, the headquarters of the United Nations is uh, well based in New York and receives a great deal of support from the host nation. And there is little point in, in uh, relocating or rotating the, the location elsewhere. Uh, if you say that there is a slight tilt towards the United States, you need to listen to the United States representatives who continuously complain that the tilt is actually on the other side and that uh, there are many countries that do not vote in favor of resolutions that are supported by the United States. Uh, and I think that uh, the fact is somewhere in between. Uh, I think the General Assembly works towards uh, reflecting world opinion, which in many cases is not consistent with the United States. Uh, and when it comes to the Security Council, then of course there is a balance of power that needs to be maintained and that needs to be uh, observed between the United States and the other powers, especially Russia and, the, and China. 
The UN was constituted uh, seven decades, more than seven decades ago, to maintain international peace and security. Has it, has it achieved that? Is it still fit for purpose in that respect? Well, if you, if you look from a negative point of view, which is that there has not been a World War III in the world, then you can say, yes, it has. Uh, I think the United Nations list of achievements on social issues, on, on uh, medical issues, on uh, development issues is probably greater than its achievements on the political issues. There are some political problems that continue to be unresolved, such as the Palestinian issue and, and others. But generally speaking, the United Nations has succeeded in preventing world-scale war, uh, has succeeded in uh, diminishing or extinguishing fires elsewhere. There, there are 16 peacekeeping operations throughout the world at the moment, all of which uh, have been uh, targeted with maintaining peace and order and security in the various countries in which they operate. Mr. Mulimi, finally, uh, I'd like to ask you a rather more personal question. You have been at, at your post for nearly 10 years. What is next for you? Have you are you planning your memoirs or perhaps sharing your wisdom uh, with young Saudi diplomats? Where do you see yourself next? It's too early to speculate on that. I am very busy and very committed uh, conducting myself in the service of the kingdom and uh, in the service of the position that I am honored to have. And as soon as I relinquish this post, I will then look into other possibilities and, and other plans. Excellency, many thanks for agreeing to come on Frankly Speaking. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you very much. The pleasure is mine.